All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to the side event hosted by Delta Electronics Foundation and Spanish government. My name is Yvonne. I'm the project supervisor of Delta Electronics Foundation. So today here we are going to discuss a very important issue, which is energy infrastructure, governance, regulatory framework to drive the transition and resilience for IBAN. We particularly want to discuss this issue just because um, we know uh, energy transition can be defined as a progress of replacing the fossil fuel with renewable energy resources. However, for Ireland, it, it, it is not always easy. We cannot just take care of energy transition. At the same time, we also need to take care of the resilience because of the um, grid system on the island are usually vulnerable and unstable compared to the system on the continent. So um, today we are very, very delighted to have four speakers who respectively come from two Spanish islands and um, one uh, corporate uh, foundation as well as a global think tank. So um, please just let me introduce our first speaker, Pep Manakaba. He is the um, DG Energy and Climate Change from the Balearic Islands. And our second um, speaker is Jose Antonio Babuena Alonso. I hope my pronunciation is right for you. Okay, so he is the Regional Secretary for Ecological Transition, Climate Change, and then planning from the Canadian Island. So I think uh, Jose Antonio, he will um, let us know a very comprehensive energy transition plan on the uh, Canadian Island. So our next speaker is uh, Mr. Wing Zhang, the CEO from Delta Electronics Foundation. So Mr. Wing Zhang, he will uh, let us know uh, the infrastructure and technology that necessary for the island uh, energy transition. And our last, but definitely not least, uh, speaker is David Gums from the uh, Global South Program Principal of RMI. Um, I think David, he will bring us a very interesting issue, which is about the cost. Like after we introduce the renewable energy on the island, that will let make people more afford uh, electricity fees or energy fees. So that will be a very interesting um, topic that we will elaborate on. So now uh, I want to uh, yield my time to our first speaker and Mr. Pat, please take your floor. Thank you, thank you very much, Yvonne, and thank you very much to to co-host this this side event. Uh, I will uh, speak to you about the energy transition in the Balearic Islands, how we want to get the sovereignty of energy in, in our archipelago and how to involve people and how to engage uh, people in that uh, in that challenge. First of all, uh, we are a region in the Mediterranean Sea, as you see, uh, that we are linked to the mainland with uh, one cable and we expect to be to have a second link on 2026. So so we are gonna be uh, almost a full integrated system to the mainland but we are still isolated system uh, and the links also uh, make us a capacity to stable the system and as you see in the in the circle our our uh, electricity system nowadays but last year sorry uh, was based on gas natural gas uh, we ran out of coal almost coal was 80 percent on 2020 uh, and then uh, now we are closing uh, thermical centers as we are developing renewables such as self-consumption and new generation and how to get this sovereignty uh, we in 2019 we had uh, the first region in spain to have an integral uh, law of energy transition and climate change and set some goals, the goals to 2030 and 2050. Nowadays, we are uh, writing the energy transition and climate change plan that 
it's how we implement, how we do the implementation to get and to reach that goal. And I think it's very important in that COP that the, the, the main topic is together for the implementation, no more uh, percentage and no more, uh, more uh, promises. Let's, let's see how we get there. And we, we're going to have goals year by year uh, sector by sector, island by island, and and that's an important thing because otherwise we cannot reach that goal only to set them. And we have special funds uh, from European Union and and recuperation and recovery system that we were going to have 233 million euros just uh, of that budget just to 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 make it perspective. Uh, the DG Energy and Climate Change on 2020 had 8 million euros and nowadays is having 80 million. So we, we apply for 10 uh, our budget, but we need to increase our resources, not only uh, economical, but also for personal. And about these uh, goals, we can achieve them and we are on a way to achieve. Uh, here you have uh, some charts about uh, renewable uh, power evolution from 2018 to 2022 nowadays. Uh, of course, we expect to reach higher. And about self-consumption, which is growing exponentially, and it's a key factor in our energy transition plan. And that's uh, some data about the, the first data of uh, energy transition plan. As you see, on 2030, we have to reach 1.6 gigawatts of uh, renewable power installed in Balearic Islands. Nowadays, we have just a bit more of 200. That's uh, a rhythm for increasing of 200 that everything we have now, we have to reach every year to go to that goal. Uh, but we can do that. We can do that if, uh, if we hurry, of course, and we have uh, personal uh, attendance and, and increasing in public sector, but also in the private sector, which is going to be uh, imposed by the funds, as I told you before. And we had a, a goal, as you see before, that on 2030 and 2050, we had to reduce consumption, energy consumption, and primary energy consumption, uh, to 40% on 2050. We're gonna reach that on 2030 if we have, if we have uh, the second link with the mainland. If we don't have it, we're gonna reach the 26%. But that's an important topic because if we can go and set the goals uh, and reach the goals before years we we set it, uh, I think it's a good message to, to the people. We are in a climate emergency. We are in a emergency of also in, in energy in Europe because the Ukraine war. Uh, so we need to speed up and we need to run faster than we did in the last years. What we have for local engagement? Well, first of all, we have a public energy company. It's uh, called Balearic Energy Institute, which nowadays is uh, developing in, in this uh, green points you, you see. Uh, self-consumption, uh, public self-consumption projects, collective self-consumption. What does it mean? Municipalities lend to the Balearic Institute their rooftops or schools, uh, public health, libraries, whatever. The Institute, uh, the Balearic Institute sets there the, the PV. And then around, we had uh, 15 days ago, just 500 meters to share the electricity with no paying taxes in self-consumption. Nowadays, it's one kilometer, and we have the promise of the uh, Spanish government that will increase in two kilometers. So we can connect industrial um, spots to red households where the consumption is balanced, meaning Industrial uh, spots are uh, consuming, uh, they consume energy while from 9 to 4, 
in uh, from Monday to Friday, and households used to do that on weekends. So uh, that's a, a good implementation for us, and that's why we need more expanded regulatory framework to develop this key solution in our land. Because we are a small land, we have uh, problems with land uses, so we need agriculture, we, we need energy, we need uh, capacity to develop another infrastructures. Uh, so we need to maximize the rooftops and uh, 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 anthropized uh, places. So we have another obligation in the law that every park that has more than five megawatts has to uh, has the obligation of to offer uh, local uh, uh, local participation in the solar parks. They have to open the 20% of that uh, solar park to if everybody, if anybody on the municipality before, then the municipalities that has the border with the other municipalities and then the, the whole Balearic the whole Balearic Islands. Now we have three solar parks that they implemented and, and we had a, a very good uh, a very good response from from the people that invest in in uh, in a project from five hundred euros, no no more if they don't want more. And that's not uh, something that you will return a lot of money. But you know where are you investing the money? You are investing the money in some solar park that will give you, in a spare way, energy in your household, in your municipality, in your community. So you are engaged in, the, in that energy transition. It's not some uh, international funds come to Balearic Islands, implement uh, or develop uh, PV parks, and then they put the hand and give and take the money. The money is staying in the Balearic Islands, even if an international fund or even in a local fund is developing that. So we are trying to, uh, and we are having this in the in the in the law, and also we are developing energy energy communities that, of course, will will be better as the. The community and the people have the return in energy, in renewable energy, that don't pay uh, a, a fee. And the prices right now in Europe are uh, so high. So nowadays, TV and self-consumption energy communities are a good way to save money, not only to fight against uh, climate. And just the last two slides. Uh, we have innovation solution, innovative solutions. We are islands, so our exportation process cannot be if uh, to go cheaper than the mainland. Just to build a chair, uh, it's always expensive in an island just because we have to send that chair by ship or by plane. So that's uh, more expensive than do it by train or trucks that they can do it in the mainland. So we have uh, the first green hydrogen plant in uh, the southern Europe, also in Spain, uh, and and we are going to have uh, we're going to have a study case that five buses of the public municipality transport company will have green hydrogen, will have the harbor of Palma, and also uh, the grid, the gas grid, also will have hydrogen, and then for last but not least, of course the sea. We are surrounded by sea, so we need to explore how the sea can give us energy solutions such as offshore wind and also uh, wave in the ports. And that's why we came with the Canary Islands to see how they are also right now developing this infrastructure. And now we want to ask the Spanish government also to do another regulatory framework for us also to be a sandbox and have the capacity to develop our first pilot in the Mediterranean for Spain. I think we can export innovation, we can export knowledge, and that's what we are doing also here, but uh, in the European Union and, and Spain.
we would like to 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 share this this with you and to learn more about other islands what they are doing we are facing the most important challenge for the humanity right now uh, and and we have to speed up as i said it before and we need it to do that with regulatory framework from us from the regional governments for the state government such as spain and also for the european union so thank you very much for your attention and afterwards uh, to you to the questions thank you very much thank you thank you Pat. so um i think from your presentations uh it's very impressive because we know energy transition is happening everywhere but um, um sometimes in somewhere it's not going so smoothly because it is opposed by the local people it's somehow affected um people's living so it's so expressive that um, you just mobilize the, the local engagement, not only the public sector, but also the community. So um, how do you um, communicate with the local community and the local people? I think that's uh, the issue that we will uh, definitely be touch upon later on in our panel discussion. So now I want to move to um, Jose Antonio. Uh, please have your board. Please uh, explain your comprehensive plan of energy sensations for Canary Island. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like, on behalf of Canary Island, uh, thanks to Delta Electronic Foundation for giving us the opportunity to be here in the COP27 to share with you some reflection about the energy transition plan uh, in Canary Island. First of all, I think I have to, to to put you an image about what uh, where are Canary Island. Canary Island are in uh, are eight island, archipelago uh, composed by eight island. They belong to Spain, but we are geographically in Africa, uh, next to Sahara. Uh, are volcanic islands, so it means that our uh, deep sea are so high, uh, more than two kilometers deep uh, in the site, that it's not possibility any possibility to connect the electricity wire to the Africa continent. And overall, it's not possible to connect the electricity system of Canary Island to the European continent. So it means that we are eight islands, and each one have to resolve their problem in energy supply, energy store, and any problem you can imagine in energy, uh, in energy conception by themselves. There are not possibility to connect the island between them. Only two of the islands are connected. We are planificated to connect. Uh, La Gomera with Tenerife. Uh, Tenerife is uh, the, the two islands in the, sim in the center, uh, the, which one is in the, in the left side. Um, and how you see, this is the scan of our energy demand. Uh, the peak uh, of the demand, the low demand per year, are 8,000 gigawatt hours, uh, with the coverage about uh, renewable energy sources of uh, 19. Point Five percent. This means that the rest of the electricity we demand are uh, based on fuel, on petrol. So this is why we have uh, elaborated this energy transition plan. As you know, an energy uh, transition is the main mitigation action with to the climate change. Is to to change those greenhouse emissions gases to know to uh, greenhouse emission gases so it's the best it's the most important mitigation action that the world can do it but in terms of canary island canary island it means the 0.06 percent of the problem in greenhouse emission in the in the planet so we are a very small point in the big problem of the plan of the of the global planet but for us it's so important because we, want, we cannot depend on fuel and petrol in the future. We have to be autonomic in energy uh, conceptions. Uh, we have two islands, Tenerife and Gran Canaria, are the main islands 
that have a low demand in each one over uh, 3,200 megawatts per hour, with uh, renewable energy sources uh, coverage about 20%. For that, we have uh, down our energy transition plan. The energy transition plan is based on eight strategies. You can see on the top of the slide. Uh, it's one strategy only for photovoltaic and self consumption strategy, another for energy storage strategy. It's so important can really the storage of our energy. Uh, the third strategy is about EV, electro electric vehicle strategies. And in Canary Island, the 70% of the demand energy are the transport way. And by road, by sea, and also by air. The fourth strategy so important for us is the geothermal energy strategy. Canary Island are volcanic islands. And uh, one year ago, we have the last eruption in the La Palma Islands. So it's so important for us we can finish the study uh, that uh, defining the potential of the geothermal energy strategy. As you know, geothermal is uh, has some advantages that not has the sun and the wind. It means that you can decide when to use the geothermal that came from the volcano. So for us it's so important. Uh, we have a fifth a strategy is the marine energy strategy. We have a, a very important amount of wind, uh, of offshore winds, due to the Alicios, or the winds that came from the north to the south in the northwest directions. Uh, because of the Alicio, Canary Island, that are in the same bowl as the Sahara Desert, but we're more desert because the wind refresh our island. And we can we have a very amount of rain and also Greenland that without the Alicia it could not be possible. So the Alicia had a big amount of speed and also are constant er, along the year. So for us a very important sources to 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 produce uh, renewable energy. The sixth ener strategy is the manageable energy strategy. We have to decide uh, when we have to use our device in our houses. Uh, it uh, depends on the amount of uh, renewable energy that we introduce inside the grids. The seventh is the green hydrogen strategy. Uh, hydrogen strategy, as you see, the, uh, the green hydrogen is the future. And the last, the eighth, is the demand side management and smart grids. With those uh, eight strategies, we have built the energy transition plan. We have studied three alternatives. The alternative O is strength, no chain. The alternative one is get the O percent greenhouse emission 2040, but with a linear, a linear uh, tent. And the alternative two, it means that the first step we have in 2030, with a, uh, with a, with a high evolution, with a low, low evolution. And the last, because we think that the technology will increase considerably in the 2030 is a very high evolution from 2030 to 2040, but with the same target. We want to be uh, uh, neutral, uh, running emission, uh, greenhouse emission gases economy in 2040, 10 years before that the target that had fished the European Union. And we think it's possible we have to Conner Island has two principal characteristics in terms of energy consumption. For example, due to the weather, we have all the year around 20 to 20, 50 degrees Celsius. We don't need to heat our houses in winter and we don't need to cool our houses in summer. So the energy demand per habitant uh, and, and per year in Canary Island are 30% below the demand in the continent, in the European Union, also in Spain. And the second, and the most important, is our industry. Our industry is not a high energy uh, demand system. It's a very low uh, energy, uh, industry, uh, uh, energy uh, components uh, in our industry. So the, the demand of our, of our economy is, is less than the demand in the continent, Euro continent. So we think 
we have a start point uh, fast. Uh, sorry, we have a, a, start, a start point front of the European Union and can let us get our reach on 2014. It has different capture, and this is the scheme of our uh, uh, of our energy systems, and that's what we want to get. We want to get a complex system that nowadays we have it. Uh, uh, the electric system. Also, we want to to approach the uh, energy to different sectors. We have a very important sector in energy storage. Without a good storage system in Canary Island, it could not be possible the energy transition in Canary Island. Um, this is the energy balance of the Canary Island uh, systems. As you see, uh, uh, we have uh, seven million uh, ton loads, uh, ton, tons of uh, petrol uh, equivalents. The big mound is going to bunkering, and around the seven per seventy percent is go to transport a system navigation road um, and and sea and only uh, around 30 uh, percent go to a generation electricity we need in our houses and our industry in our society uh, this is the initial situation in in 2019 and we want to reach in 2030 the first steps is that i um, i would like you to appreciate the difference between the conventional term, the, the, the electricity that is produced by burning fuel. Nowadays, is, uh, we have installed a giant for exploitation of uh, 2,357 megawatts, and we are going to get this potential in 2030 in 1,440 megawatts. So we have to decrease if we really want to and get the energy transition in the Canary Island. And how you see the, over this uh, amount, we have the different uh, sources, renewable resources in the energy mix. Offshore means, uh, onshore means, uh, PV, floating PV, PV cell consumption, biomass, wave energy, high enthalpy geothermal, solar thermal, and small scale uh, hydro. And I, uh, you have to uh, to get your your attention in the storage. We need the storage. We need a very big amount of storage. Nowadays, we have a very less, uh, very short amount of storage. So we need this amount of storage, more than three gigawatts of capacity of the storage. If we really want to change the the fuel energy into renewable energy. In Canary Island, uh, in Europe, uh, there are more or less uh, 1,300 hours of solar uh, to produce electricity. In Canary Island, we we are more than 1,800 hours per year. And we talk about term of wind, it's the same. We have more hours of wind in Canary Island than in the mainland. This is the global objective of the energy transition plan. We want to improve the energy efficiency of our buildings in the 27%. It's not only uh, to change the fuel energy with renewable energy, it's also to get uh, decrease the demand of energy. And it means we have to improve in our energy efficiency in our buildings. We want that the renewable on the end use of energy reach the 29%. And uh, in terms of electricity generation, it uh, reached the 62%. And some economic indicator, the total investment we need uh, from now to 2030 are more than uh, 6,240 million euros. In British uh, amount, it means 6 billion millions, 6 billion of euros. It means uh, more than the 2. 5% of our GPD. This is our how we think it's going to evolve uh, to, 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 to evolve the different sources. Um, also, is I'm going to the end because we are not fun enough. In terms of social impact, the energy transition is overall a social action to the people. 
uh, a just transition is a demand of our people. We want to get that when you arrive to Canary Island by plane, you don't have, you don't, uh, uh, you don't distinguish if the house is a, uh, if richer than the other house because the richer houses has photovoltaic panels and uh, no richer, and the less richer houses didn't have, don't do, uh, doesn't have it. So this is the transition we need. Uh, the social impact for our energy transition plants, uh, we estimate that we can generate 410 new jobs per year. That it means that from nowadays to 2030, we could create uh, 7,392 new jobs. And also the, the change of value point number two of the energy transition is so important. So next, with the energy transition plan, we have a just a transition actions, and we have to detect it so early the energy poverty. We know that it's not easy for everybody to uh, change the fuel system and to put on the stall photovoltaic planet or to change their uh, car with the EV car. It's so expensive nowadays. So we have to avoid that the energy transition uh, increase the difference between the different level of the social uh, the social level in Canary Island. And also, we have a communication plan. As says my colleague from Balear government, the best communication plan nowadays is to increase, the so fast increase, of the price of the electricity in Spain. Uh, people uh, that uh, put photovoltaic planet or change their car for a uh, EV car can share with their friends how it has decreased in the, the amount of money they have to pay and that amount in the electricity feeds on the petrol that uh, put inside the car. So this is the best communication plan. So nowadays we think that the, um, the energy transition is just a reality. We think that uh, if we if we put 10 years ago and we imagine how we are going today in the amount of photovoltaic panel, panels or in the amount of EV vehicles, uh, it could be a, an illusion. And, uh, fantasy films, and so I think that uh, not only can Ireland reach the 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 transition, the energy transition 2040. I think that how we can read in different newspaper all the world, or the European Union want to accelerate the energy transition because it's the only solution uh, if we were want to uh, act in the most important mitigation action we have in our planet and is the energy transition. So, thank you very much for your for the opportunity and your life to, to finish how I began. Thanks on behalf of Golden Open to Delta Electronic Foundation for the opportunity that you give us. Thank you, thank you. Well, I think Jose Antonio, he just mentioned a very important um, point, which is um, now uh, the energy price is being Crazy in Europe, and we know it's very crazy. But uh, uh, why don't we think that uh, it's probably an opportunity, a good timing to do the energy transition? And uh, apparently, you can see on um, Canary Islands, they have like a very comprehensive um, pictures regarding the transition. They can uh, investment, technology, and even the social impact into their pathway. So we can somehow build a how ambitious you are to achieve the goal. But I also believe um, you definitely encounter some challenges and difficulties. So maybe you can share this part um, in our panel discussion. Okay? So now uh, I want to yield my time to uh, Mr. Wing Chang. So he will uh, talk about how Delta Electronics Foundation offer the technology and its infrastructure that can uh, boost the great operations on the island. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen.
uh, it's a great honor for me to join this energy transition pioneer uh, uh, section because we really have a lot of children from here and uh, it's also an honor for me to present on Delta Electronic Solution to help facilitate the energy transition and the resilience on islands. As most people know, traditional independent energy systems usually make islands more vulnerable to extreme weather occurs. Oh, also, in these days, grid management become more challenging after abundant renewable energy sources are introduced. So how can we smoothen the grid operation with achieving the net zero goal? This is the issue that Delta wants to tackle low technology. Today I will use two tourist attraction islands, Timon and Oki Island, to extract the infrastructure necessary for the island energy transition. Their original uh, isolated energy system is both them to frequent power outage and breakouts during the tourist season. However, they both are on their way to build a more resilient and sustainable power grid. First, I will talk about Kingman. It has been selected as a model low carbon island for more than 10 years and uh, attempts to become the first smart grid demonstration island in Taiwan. Nevertheless, this island faces some technical issues today. The power load portion in Kingman is between 20 to 16 megawatts from winter of peak to summer peak. So there exists a huge gap in energy demand between summer and winter, which is very hard for power dispatchers. What also challenges is the grid system uh, is the rapid growing renewable energy. The installation capacity of the renewables in Kingman can almost 100% supply local household in off-peak season, but it also means the independence of the renewable energy will expose it one million tourists to face no probability of power outage and breakouts. On the other hand, the OK Islands, it just used to hit a record high due to the heat tree breaking tourists this summer. The fragile power grid now facing to other challenges, the extreme weather by warmer sea temperatures. So far, most electricity in OK Island comes from diesel generators, which have long opposed by local habitants, so there exists an agency to introduce new infrastructure that can help make the power system cleaner and more resilient. Delta Electronics is a global provider of power and terminal management solution and it has been listed on the index of Dow Jones Sustainable Index for 11 consecutive years in, since 2011 and recognized by the CDP project with two A leadership uh, label leading for mitigated climate change. We took these two islands as our target for our low carbon island solutions. Cooperating with power companies we introduced energy storage and power conditioning systems to Kingman and OK Island. These systems offer high efficiency power capability for demand management, frequency regulation, energy shift, and the renewable energy smoothing. The system is integrated with bi-direction power conditioning system, battery combined devices, and the battery management system, side controllers, and a cloud-based management system to provide comprehensive energy storage functions for utility applications. Our energy storage system has multiple uh, modes to stabilize the grid system. It can adjust the output power according to the utility frequency, voltage level, and electricity generation. Having a constant circle of utility frequency is the key to grid stability. So, we need to ensure the frequency is charging regularly with the particular range. In Kingman and the OK Island, we add the frequent watt mode to detect the continuous oscillation of frequency for 24 hours and regulate the frequency by controlling the power flow back and forth, low adaptive charging and discharging of the energy storage system. We also did another mode 
code, uh, rate of change of frequency as known as the raw code for breakout prevention. Under this mode, once it detects a certain decline of frequency, then it will cause the potential to break out the energy storage system will output electricity as full power within 0 0.0 seconds to pull the frequency back to the normal range and keep discharging until the frequency is fully stabilized. By combining frequent one mode for constant frequency and the low code mode for breakout prevention, the function of the energy storage is fully utilized to ensure island grid resilience. These two modes are all adopted in Kingman and OK Island. After one year's installation, we are happy to see that the energy storage system has successfully helped prevent the power outage 61 times in Kingman and further stabilize the grid. With the systems, these two islands can not only reduce the outage of diesel generators that cause the blackout, uh, that's the cause of blackout, but also support more renewables integrate to the grid in the future. That helps avoid not only all local air pollution, but also carbon emissions. Now I want to play the video demonstrating how climate change and tourist activities impact the power system in Oki Island and they introduce how the energy storage system can help stabilize the grid operation.
particularly want to highlight that in addition to people on OK Island, a lot of indigenous people group around the world are suffering from climate change as well. But this year, we just hear a press on the UN Human Rights Council. It announced that the Australian government to uh, provide the indigenous people on Torres Strait Island with compensations for having those and damages. So we hope there will be more cases like this uh, coming out to have islanders fight against climate change. For Delta, offering technology is a way that we adopt to help local people dealing with climate change, but that is not enough. When we introduce energy storage system, we realize that people keep suspicious of the installations. To make them become part of the transition, we need more communications. We cooperate with local foundations to implement the uh, corporate uh, to implement the energy education. We take children to our energy storage system and uh, explain how it was on site. In the future, we will continue the sharing and the communication and uh, make more people know the situation. At the end of my presentation, I must highlight again the importance of the energy storage system for achieving energy disease and then zero growth. Also, like Delta, uh, we cannot just offer the technology. We still uh, need to update ourselves to help people understand the transition and even make them part of the transition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wei. Um, I think we, we see a very important from our Wei's presentation, which is uh, not all islands are suitable for uh, renewable energy. And also, uh, renewable energy alone cannot um, literally achieve a uh, net zero goal. So we somehow must um, couple with the technology, which is energy storage system. So um, like in the future, we really hope that uh, this case will be uh, scale up and help more islands uh, to um, have to, to, to be uh, net zero, to achieve their net zero goal. So thank you, Okay, so uh, next is David, it's your turn. And um, please just let us know like, how OMI um, build the resilience, equity, and uh, reduce the cost through renewable energy microgrid on island. Please take a floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this uh, panel session. Um, I, I really do love the compilation of different um, islands, regions, and um, challenges that are faced in, in each of the different regions. And I love the last video. It's very touching because at the end of the day, all the work we do impact people. And these are things that um, when we talk about a just and equitable energy transition, which is a lot of the discussion that happens here at COP, um, we have to think about the impact on people and, and how um, that transition will lead to betterment of their life in various ways. And I think it all sort of gets incorporated. And I'll talk a little bit about RMI and what we do. Uh, RMI is uh, traditionally seen as a, a think tank type organization, but we've transformed into an organization that we, what we say is we, we think, do, and we scale. And I'll talk a little bit about each of those aspects, but essentially what we're about is to reduce um, global emissions around the, and through the energy transition. And we try to do that in a way that, that um, consider the impact on people's lives and, and how it improves their livelihood and also um, in ways that are either economical or add into more resilient um, infrastructure for them and improving their lives. We're a globally based organization. We've extended and grown significantly over the last few years. And what we do specifically in the context of where I work in the Caribbean islands, um, we focus on uh, three, uh, actually it's four levers that we focus on in the way we approach projects. And we, we look at 
projects from the standpoint of energy resilience, and I'll talk a little bit about why in the next couple of slides. Uh, energy equity, because for all of us everywhere, our involvement in the impact of, of energy, which is a, a significant part of our lives, and, and we rely on it so severely, it's important that we're involved in that discussion. And then in the Caribbean context, you'll see also why lowering costs is such a significant factor. Then, of course, climate impact, which you'll also understand, because I think it was discussed in the context a little bit just now in terms of typhoons and impact uh, in, in, in uh, the islands that were presented previously. So I'm from Anguilla, small island in the Caribbean, about 15,000 people. So much of my presentation will be bringing that perspective. Um, I was the CEO of the Anguilla Electricity Company, and uh, part of my experience in the 12 years that I was working at the Anguilla Electricity Company, I had to deal with many, many different storms. And you can see from this illustration here, this is a historical chart of storms in the Caribbean region. And my island is sort of in the middle of all of that pathway. So we've experienced quite a number of severe storms and they've become more frequent and more severe. So it impacts us tremendously. So everything we do um, encompasses some sense of resiliency because that's what we need to, to, in order to survive. So as things get worse, as climate change and the impacts of that uh, impact us, what we call at ground zero, we have to incorporate a lot more resilience in the design of our energy systems. Another aspect of this, and we just had a couple of storms that passed through the region, Hurricane Fiona and Hurricane Ian. And oftentimes you'll hear about the impact that they have uh, on the mainland US because that's where the media centers are, that's where much of the attention is given. But truly these storms pass through a number of islands and they're very destructive. And I'll show you another aspect of why this is so relevant because when a storm impacts an island, it destroys that island's GDP to the tune of two and a half times its GDP, annual GDP. And if you can imagine what that would mean in any developed country context, when a storm hits Florida or Louisiana in the US, mainland US, it impacts, it has a significant financial impact. But as a whole, it's a very small percentage of the country's economic development. In a Caribbean island, you essentially wipe out five to 10 years of development with one category five storm. So that impacts our lives in so many ways because we essentially take 10 years to build up resources, it gets wiped out, and we have to start all over for another 10 years. But what's happening is these storms are coming more frequently. And on average, they're coming every five years. So we can't rebuild fast enough so we're moving backward. Here is just a sense of the impact and the frequency um, of the storms, okay? So when we look at the Caribbean islands as a region, we consider ourselves ground zero for climate change because we have the, the, the effects of climate change impacts us six times more than any other region. If we're talking about small island developing states, we're still two and a half times more than the average small island developing state. So the, the consequences of climate change is very significant for us. Here's where it all comes together. So what all this destruction, what's all this damage, and what does our current infrastructure mean to us? It shows up in our cost. Our GDP per capita is extremely low. It's some of the lowest uh, in the world. Not the lowest, but some of the lowest. However, and if we're going to compare the average Caribbean island to say the US mainland, our GDP per capita income is four times lower than the US average. However, our energy cost is four times higher than the US average. So what that means is that we have to work 
10 times harder to pay our energy bills than, than someone living in mainland America. That's a significant thing because if you are making $10,000 a year, US dollars, if you're making 10,000 US dollars a year, and such a large percentage of your income is going to energy rather than education, food, and all the other things that we need to survive, it impacts us more severely and it makes it difficult for us to progress. That is driven by imported fossil fuel. We're small islands, we're about 30 islands, main islands, there are many smaller islands that are part of uh, different uh, um, systems, but essentially the 30 major countries are dispersed, we're not interconnected, and we don't have the, inter the ability to interconnect economically. We're varying population, varying cultures, so it makes it a very difficult environment to operate in. However, at the end of the day, we have to solve the problem. And this is just a sample of six different countries, um, Angola being one of them. Montserrat, an island that is impacted by volcanic activity and hurricanes, is at 60 cents per kilowatt hour. That's US cents, okay? In the US, it's about 15 cents per kilowatt hour. So how do we solve this problem? We look at the problem through the lens of solving the resiliency because we have such a high frequency of storms. That comes with an additional premium for the systems that we install. We also look at it from equity and what that means for everyone across the system and within the country. And, and how do we make sure they have a say and participate in the solutions that we bring to the table. And at the end of the day, climate change matters and, and it matters because we know the impact it has on us. If we're not part of the solution, we're part of the problem. And that problem is creating a lot of challenges for us locally with increased storms and increased intensity of storms. But the biggest driver that motivates people is lowering their cost because it's such an impactful element of, of the energy system and our energy, yeah, energy, the economy in, in those countries, all right? Talk a little bit about a couple of examples. This is an island called Ragged Island. It's part of the Bahamas chain of islands. And this island was devastated by Hurricane Irma in 2017. There was talk about evacuating the entire island and moving people to what is considered the main island of mainland. Of course, people push back. People don't want to move from their home. They've been there for hundreds of years. It's their culture. It's what they believe in. It's where they want to live. And they want to adapt and make that system livable for them, economical for them, but still live reasonably comfortable with the the, the energy security and the comforts of, of having energy um, at a reasonable price. So the solution that we put together after lots of consultation with the folks on the ground, with the people that live there, is to put in a microgrid system that enables them to run from solar PV for 93% of the time. The way we've been able to do that is by incorporating like the previous presentation, battery storage systems that can basically transition the production from the daytime into the nighttime and for a small period of the day, uh, they can um, receive power from the battery storage. Now, the, the reason why this is significant, it's a small system on a small island, but it's the pilot project that led to the development of from 300 kilowatt system to six megawatts plus. And every day this system is shown as the example of how things can happen. And I'll tell you the one great selling point about this system. This was commissioned in about November of 2021. Since that system was commissioned, and this slide is a few months old, six months had passed and they had not imported one gallon of diesel up to that point, one additional gallon from what they had in reserve. So 
that shows that for, for six months of a year, they don't have to import any additional fuel. So that means their cost has gone down tremendously. And as you can imagine, from 2021 to today, because of the crisis, particularly in Europe, what that has done to the cost of uh, diesel, gasoline, and, and, and essentially drives up the cost of energy. So they've been able to lock in through the system low, stable, and resilient energy prices. This system is designed for category five hurricane resilience, okay? So now you have a system that can survive future storms, lower prices, and supply them with energy that helps to keep their environment clean, lower noise pollution, and just fits into the natural elements of that community. So many solutions have been um, solved here. The next example is in the British Virgin Islands. And this is a system that we're currently um, working through and, and should be commissioning within the next 24 months. Essentially, this system is designed as a critical facility, microgrid, that's part of a larger island uh, called Tatola. What the system is designed to do, it's at a community college, but that community college also serves as a shelter during hurricanes. There's a small community around the, the college that is gonna be supported by this microgrid. We're installing a 10 megawatt microgrid that will allow this, this community with battery storage to disconnect from the grid during the storms. When the grid is down, they'll still be con uh, supplied with power from the microgrid. And should, the, so should something happen in a severe uh, case, a uh, severe storm where the microgrid has to go down, it can be recovered through battery storage in the first instance and recovered through solar production uh, within days. But this shelter will have continued service the neighborhood and surrounding community will have continued service through underground cabling. And um, there is also one critical element that is there, which is a water treatment and pumping station. Which So this, this pumping station is critical for the entire island to supply the entire island with water. So we're bringing a system that's gonna solve many, many different problems. And at the end of the day, that system is also category five resilient so it can survive the storms um, of, of today and the future so those are a couple of examples um, we could talk more about different technological solutions that we're, we're bringing to the table and implemented in the Caribbean islands uh, we worked across 20 different islands so there are many different projects that that we can talk about but the one thing that I want to mention and I'm pretty excited about this because we actually just launched this product yesterday. And it's the Caribbean Climate Smart Fund, which is essentially what we found is that over the years we've worked with the islands, we've brought through tens of projects that have become bankable. Some of the examples I've shown here, but we've run into a barrier in terms of attracting finance. And because of the small scale of the projects relative to what may happen in Europe or some larger um, um, jurisdictions, they don't attract as much developers, private sector financing. Um, so we have to bring creative solutions to the region in order to achieve our goals, which is to transition the region, uh, similar to how we did Ragged Island, to if not 100%, close to 100% renewable energy. In order to do that, we've created the, the Caribbean Climate Smart Fund, which is going to help us finance and bring investment to these projects and get them um, to, the, uh, to the end stage. One more thing I'll mention, in terms of the approach we use, it's an approach that is pretty comprehensive and incorporates the experience that we've had over the past 10 years working in the region. And as you can imagine, working with 30 different countries you're dealing with different cultures, different languages, different uh, local needs, and, and different levels of capacity and availability of people and, and different resources to bring to this, this, this transition effort. 
So what we do is we try to use um, a, a lens of how we approach this by incorporating people as part of the process, bringing a lot of consultation and involvement into the solutions that we, we provide. Many of the solutions are the same, but if we go to any, any single country and we say, here is the solution for you, it will be rejected. We could get to the same solution, but we got to get there by talking to people because people want to feel like it's part of their solution and they don't want a solution imposed on them. So at the end of the day, we incorporate a, a process, we bring people into this, we consider equity, we consider resilience because of the impact, and we consider the impact of climate and the benefits that we bring to that. So I think that's the, the last slide. I'll leave it there. I'm happy to uh, talk and discuss any other areas that you appear to. Thank you. Thank you, David. So um, I think it's really good that uh, we hear from the um, Caribbean islands, like how people there uh, are suffering uh, climate loss and damage. And I remember yesterday, yesterday uh, when I met um, Pat and Jose Antonio, you also mentioned that climate change is actually changing people's living, their lives on um, the Arctic Island and Canada Islands. And like in Taiwan, I personally also joined the um, trip to the Oki Island to do the filming. And unfortunately, um, after we, after our departure from um, that island, the uh, Oki Island is actually, was actually um, suffering a extreme rainfall, which also disrupted the uh, energy and transport system. So we can somehow, like uh, in this side then, um, people living on island are the front, at the front lines of climate change, and that is for sure. So it's very necessary to drive the transition and to um, minimize the use of um, fossil fuel as soon as possible. But I believe now we have a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, solutions here. But um, I'm curious if that uh, for you all, for different islands, like what kind of challenge you have already encountered uh, during this uh, transition and our resilience promotion. So yeah, that's what we'll be the first one. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, well, there are a lot of challenges. <laughs> if I had to pick one, uh, maybe to, to encourage the people that they have to change. I mean, uh, I mean, we can plan how we change, and then maybe we our GDP is going to grow maybe one two percent, or we can grow. Uh, with a shock, and that GDP uh, are going to to decrease around 12 and 19 percent, and and that's not about the people, it's not about the, the the citizens. Maybe it's for the companies that we have to engage uh, for this energy transition, that climate action. Uh, it's not only energy, it's water, it's uh, it's garbage, it's uh, a lot of a lot of issues. And I think the, the challenge is to keep all of them in the same train. And it's, that, that's, that's, for, that's, for me, it's the main challenge. And afterwards, as, um, as I don't remember, <laughs> the, the, the last panel say, uh, if they are not involved in the energy transition or in, or in climate action, they will not take that as their but the thing is how to get them in that term. For, for, for us, it's a challenge. We are doing. We are. Uh, we, uh, we have. Uh, we have a framework. We have uh, uh, investments. We have subsidies. We have a lot of things that we want to do. But but if they are not engaged, uh, this is the for me the main challenge. Well, uh, I think uh, we have many challenges. Have to pay. Um, we're all very uh, We have a real debate between the environment protection and then we to develop different uh, that has impact in the land. 
and bring in the finance to the table to invest in these systems. And once we solve those two problems, um, we're going to go from, in some cases, 1% renewable energy to 90% rather quickly because there are a lot of small islands, so the solutions can come fast. It's just a matter of bringing the solutions to the table. Okay, so um, my next question is that um, what the key factor um, if we want to scale up um, the renewable energy or the low carbon um, transitions on island? Yeah, um, we know uh, it is not easy. So does that mean we need to change the uh, regulatory framework, or um, we must engage more people? So how can we do it? Uh, well, I think, uh, yes, both. Uh, we need to, at least in Spain, and that's something we share with the Canary Islands, we need a, a regulatory framework specific for non-mainland uh, territories. Uh, and, and we need to be the first to have um, a storage capacity framework because we are going to be the first to, to have more renewable energy than demand in some uh, hours, so we need to store that energy because we are not, we cannot send energy to the mainland. Uh, and for example, we have a, an example in, in the island of Menorca, it's in the northern island, that it's going to produce 100, uh, 150 megawatts, and the peak of seasonal in, was a record high uh, last year, uh, was 120. So this 30 megawatts, we cannot uh, let ourselves to, to throw it to the water. We need, uh, in this energy crisis we have in Europe, but in this climate crisis we have around the world, we have to, to reach all the, the, energy, the renewable energy to not burn any fossil fuel, fossil fuel, fossil fuel. And then engage people. And then again, to engage people, we have to, to to be attractive in the investment, so so we we have to uh, still having this uh, subsidies uh, policy that we are we are doing, and also for the companies and the public administration that we are uh, high consumers of, of energy, and and we need to be a model that then the citizens and the companies will be more confident to, with the public administration that, okay, if you are doing that, I will do the same because if you are doing that, it's because it's cheaper, it's good for you, and even uh, the climate uh, the climate action. But I, I want to say something, I mean, I think you, you mentioned before, island citizens uh, are the most vulnerable in the, in, in the climate uh, crisis in the, in the meaning we are more vulnerable at the uh, sea rise level uh, here in the Mediterranean. We are in, the, in, in Taiwan, you have typhoons. You have in the Caribbean. There, you have a lot of uh, meteorological incidents, and and also in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, uh, we have to be the first. We have to be pioneering the not only the energy transition, also the climate action in in other ways, because if we are not doing that. How people from, for example, Sweden, Norway, Germany, in the, in the inside of the countries, that maybe two or three degrees more, they are not a big deal for them, but they are a big deal for us. So we have to, to be the first to do that. Well, it's the same. The, the, the responsibility of the energy regulation is the national, it's in, it's at national level, the regional level. We don't have this capability because of the Spanish constitution. So the key factor is the legal framework. We have more difficult than the mainland to can introduce the different renewable resources inside the electric grid. You know? For example, there is not a storage market in Canary Island, also in Barrio Island, in the Spanish island. So if some company wants to do uh, in a storage park, they don't know how it's going to pay the electricity that could be stored there if the grid needs it. So it's not it's a it's a weak point for the investment in the storage system in Canary Island. 
or for example the PPA. The PPA are not allowed in the islands. Uh, so we don't have a problem with the technology. The technology is uh, developed now to accelerate the transition in the island. We have the barriers in the frame, in the legal framework. Um, and that's why we demand to the national government. We need a real uh, legal framework that let us uh, the energy transition, the energy transition in the island. Because if we don't get it, this uh, specific uh, legal framework, all the transition, energy transition plan we have designed will be impossible to develop it. Nowadays, uh, with only 20% of, uh, of the amount of uh, power stored in, the, in, 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 Canary, in Canary Island, compared to the amount of, of power stored, uh, pure, pure power uh, with the renewable store, on the, the 20% are renewable, and you cannot approach all the, the, the parts that are stored because the grid is not capable to uh, absorb the, the electricity that they produce. So the key factor is a factor, it's a legal factor, not a technological factor. Thank you. So we may have a um, quick answer from David because we're run on, running out of time. I want to save some time for our audience. So yeah, please. Yeah, certainly. I think I, I echo all the points. Um, the only other part of this I've mentioned is the um, I already talked about the involvement of the people. In the Caribbean, we have a unique opportunity because 80% of the utilities are government-owned. So they're owned by the people. And if we introduce new systems, we have to make sure that people have some ownership. And that's a very critical point. When we introduce, go from fossil fuel to renewables, there's a new investment. Who owns that investment will determine whether the project will proceed or not. If people are not part of the ownership, it's not going to happen. Thank you. So we still have like seven minutes left. Uh, I probably will open two questions from the audience. And uh, is there anyone having the questions I want to throw it to our panelists? so much. This has been very impressive presentation. And I'm wondering, uh, you have mentioned about this legal framework and the citizen participation. Like 20% of the, 20% well, has to go to the local community. How about actually, you know, it's operational? Like 20% in terms of initial capital investment or 20% about profit sharing? Or in terms of the process, do you have any like public hearing or public consultation meetings with the local residents? And also, last about the ownership, whether the local residents actually own this company at 20%, and how their voices will be heard. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, well, now the, the three first parts we have, they they set uh, the investment of the project, and then open to kind of crown founded, uh, and then they have they have with uh, a company which is specialized in uh, fund some projects, not uh, in, a, in an obligation way. Uh, and then you have um, an, a, an investment return per year. Uh, even if you have you have two choices, you have uh, one choice to invest for 30 years. You have a three percent per year. And then if you have only for five years, and then the mass, the, the most important company resell your participation, you have it at six five six point five percent of uh, investment return. So. That's that's the first one. So now we are uh, developing in a re uh, in a regulatory framework in our uh, in our community, and we have three choices. The first one is that one. The second one is about what is the benefit or the profit of that part, and then you have the 20% of the profit of or 0.01, 0 
Uh, and then the third one is to establish an energy community, then you will not have an uh, income, but you will have an energy return. And that's that's something that we are going to have it to have to to, uh, to do it maybe next year when it will be possible to do that uh, change in the law. I can also take one more question. So, anyone from the audience? No. Okay. So, uh, any panelists who want to supplement your point, then I think we can take the moment now. Or make the final speech, maybe David. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you once again for the opportunity to share our experiences uh, from the Caribbean region. Uh, there are a lot of similarities in, in the solutions and the challenges that we face. Um, but what I've realized is that um, each country, each um, approach has to be a little different because you're considering a new set of people. And so no one solution fits um, every country, every region. Uh, but the, the one thing that I'd, I'd like for us to walk away with is the people aspect of this and, and having people participate uh, in the solutions, having people own uh, some of the solutions uh, because it impacts their lives tremendously. Energy is one of those things I used to take for granted uh, even when I was the CEO of the company. But when you realize the immediate and direct impact that you have on someone's livelihood, uh, on a child who can't, or a family that can't afford electricity, uh, the lights are out, it impacts their ability to study at night. And I grew up at a time when we didn't have electricity on the island. And I had to study with a lamp. And that's a significant difference studying with a lamp because you only get a few hours. And, and I didn't realize the health implications because you're inhaling the fumes from the oil that, that's fueled in the lamp. So there's so many impacts of electricity on your day-to-day -day life. Uh, it's so important that, that people are part involved and part of the solution. And what I've found is that they'll become the champions for making sure it happened. And when, whether it's special interests that gets in the way, or whatever it is, they'll help you break down those barriers because they feel they're part of the process. So I really enjoyed learning from everyone on the panel and the different experiences that you've had. Thank you, David. I think it's a very touching story from your personal experience. Okay, so we are running out of time, and once again, I want to appreciate all our distinguished panelists and our audience for coming, and let's just keep acting for Ireland. Thank you.